So let's uh, let's talk about clocks. In any theory which has time reversal invariance, or CPT for that matter, if a forward going if a forward going clock can exist, a forward going clock means one whose clock time tracks t, the mathematical time, approximately. Then a backward going clock can also exist. The time reversal operation on a forward going clock is a backward going clock. If T exists, then backward going clocks have to exist. An example of a clock, a very simple example of a clock would be a heavy particle moving on a line, non-relativistic with a Hamiltonian P squared over two M. Uh, let the coordinate of the particle of the object be called tau. Tau, of course, is the coordinate which represents the clock time. Commutator of tau with p is i h bar, usual quantum mechanics, and tau is the clock time. If we construct a wave packet, which is narrow, not too broad, wave packet in, um, let's say, in momentum space, and which is supported almost entirely for positive momentum, then that particle will move to the right and tau will increase with time. That's one kind of wave packet. But for every such wave packet, there's another wave packet for which P goes to minus P. It's actually just a complex conjugate wave function in which the clock moves in the opposite direction. So for every clock or every state of the clock, which is a forward moving clock, there's a state of the clock, which is a backward moving clock. So clocks can go forward and clocks can go backward. And in fact, in this picture where clocks are simply intermittent fluctuations, there is equal probability for forward going clocks and backward going clocks. And I wanted to add, ask Ed a question at this point, but I'll, I'll save this for the end. Um, we'll come back, to my, come back to my question. But what I said is, is, is certainly true. What is a forward going clock? A forward going clock is just one whose wave function is such that d tau by dt is positive. I'll set it equal to one, but um, it doesn't actually have to be one. It could be three, it could be five, it doesn't matter. Uh, and a backward going clock is a state of the clock for which d tau by dt is minus one. That's all the forward going clocks and backward going clocks mean. Forward going clocks and backward going clocks are fluctuations. They fall back into the horizon. Here's a forward going clock, and by T reversal, here's a backward going clock. Now, this dotted line over here is another system which is emitted into the static patch and which is the object of study by the clock and the observer. Here's the clock and the observer, and the clock and the observer are studying this system which is emitted and absorbed. Here it is being emitted and absorbed and studied by a backward going clock or by a forward going clock. That's the system. I'm gonna make a simple model now, just for fun. I'm gonna make a simple model. The thing which is emitted and absorbed is just a harmonic oscillator, a particle on a spring. It's not the clock. Keep in mind, this line is not the clock. It's the system being observed. And I'll assume that it has a Hamiltonian, uh, approximately has a, can approximately be separated from the rest of the system, and it has an approximate Hamiltonian, which for the moment I'm going to identify with I d by d t, where t is the mathematical abstract time, not the clock time. Okay. I'm assuming that there is such a Hamiltonian, and that it's just q squared plus p squared over two. Q being uh, coordinate. Again, Q is not the clock time. It's just the oscillator time. It's easy to calculate for a harmonic oscillator what the imaginary part of the correlator of Q of zero and Q of T is. It's just sine T, it's sine omega T, but I said omega equal to one. It's just sine T, that's what it is. Now, for a forward going clock, we want to, we want to dress these operators now. For a forward going clock, tau is approximately equal to t. 
So that means for a forward going clock, the imaginary part of Q of zero and Q of tau is sine of tau. I just replaced T by tau. On the other hand, for a backward going clock, tau is minus T. And so the imaginary part of Q of zero and Q of T is minus sine of T for a backward going clock. Now this is not what we want. If T is truly a gauge redundancy, then it would be important that the imaginary part of this correlation function, the sign of it and the properties of it are independent of whether it's a backward going clock or a forward going clock. Backward going clocks and forward going clocks should have exactly the same properties if it's just a gauge uh, redundancy. The sign of Q of zero and Q of T should be the same for forward going clocks and backward going clocks. So I failed, but nevertheless, let's try to achieve what I want. Define an operator that's an operator that lives in the Hilbert space of a clock. Let's call it epsilon. Epsilon equals plus one for forward going clocks and epsilon equals minus one for backward going clocks. It's an operator made of the clock degrees of freedom. And it's easy to check that it's odd on the time reversal. Here's the proof right here. Don't worry about it. It is odd on the time reversal. And let's take the clock of the system, sorry, the Hamiltonian of the system not to be p squared plus q squared over two, but epsilon times p squared plus q squared over two. Now this is a little bit crazy. What it's saying is the Hamiltonian of the system depends on the clock the, and the clock, whether it's forward going or backward going. By Hamiltonian, I mean d by d tau, i d by d tau. It's a possible operator. Uh, Let's try that out as a hypothesis. Then we would find that Q of zero and Q of T is not sine I sine T, but is I epsilon times sine T. Notice that in this case, the trace of this commutator is zero by virtue of the fact that the trace of epsilon is equal to zero. Epsilon has two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one. And so the trace of Q of zero and Q of T would be as required, would be equal to zero. But now when we dress the operator, replace T by tau, we find that Q of zero, Q of T commutator is I sine of tau, the same for forward going clocks and backward going clocks. That's exactly what we want, but it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit crazy because it's saying that the clock, which may be sitting at r equals zero and the harmonic oscillator, which may be far from r equals zero are interacting. They're interacting in that the Hamiltonian of the system here depends on the clock variable epsilon. But I think that's the way it has to be. I don't think there's any way out of that. I think that's one of the things that, uh, that I've learned from this exercise, that the clock must interact with systems that it's measuring in a highly non-trivial way in a holographic theory. Okay, so if I'm right, then the, Hamilton, then the, uh, then the clock must interact in a highly non-trivial way with a holographic theory. No factorization of a holographic theory. Well, factorization just means things are, um, are uh, not interacting. Let's come back to gauge fixing for a moment. I said earlier that, uh, that gauge fixing is just pi equals one. Now pi, the existence of a clock, is the sum of two projection operators, projection operator for forward going and backward going clocks. I don't think pi equals one is good enough. I think in order to reproduce the, um, the, uh, the semi-classical limit, the right gauge fixing condition is that pi of a forward going clock, or you could use a backward going clock too, but that you should choose a forward going clock. Now I have no doubt that when 
uh, Edward and his colleagues were thinking about this, the clocks that they imagined were forward going clocks. So I don't think they made a mistake by not, uh, by not saying the clock is forward going. I think they just assumed it was a forward going clock. But here we see that it really is important that you get the wrong answers. Uh, you, you wind up averaging over forward going and backward going clocks. And that is what sets the imaginary part to zero. Is there anything that we can compute which does not require thinking about clocks and which can be used to convert? convert? Now, the reason I would like to get away from clocks because, because the building of a clock and a holographic theory, I have, who, know, who the hell knows how to build clocks? And um, uh, we would rather avoid the issue of actually constructing a clock in the system. Is there anything that we can calculate um, at least approximately, which doesn't require us to build a clock. As far as I can tell, the real part of correlation functions like phi of t1 and phi of t2, as far as I can tell, does not require a clock. The real part of correlation functions um, might be something that can be directly computed with bulk calculations in the semi-classical theory Here's what they look like, the real part of correlation functions. They have this little glitch in them. In fact, if you plot the logarithm of the correlation function, that's always a good thing to calculate for plot. The logarithm of the correlation function, it almost exactly looks like a, um, like a uh, exponentially falling curve, the kind of thing you might expect for a, um, for a low mass particle in uh, in the sitter space, very low mass particle, just exponentially to the minus mu t in mu or something. It has this little glitch here. The little glitch is a feature, but it's a very minor feature when plotted globally like this. It does come from this scattering off r equals zero, but now perhaps we should say that it comes from scattering off the clock. I'm not sure of that, but... Uh, and in that sense, if we were willing to ignore the clock, maybe that's just ignoring this little glitch here. I don't know, but I'm thinking that that might be true. In any case, if anything is clock sensitive, whether it's a Rolex clock or a Timex clock, it would be the fine structure in this glitch here, which would be sensitive or which uh, the correlation function might be sensitive to because the glitch is actually just the scattering off r equals zero, which is where there either is or isn't a clock. Forward going, backward going. The imaginary part is extremely sensitive. The real part might be sensitive, but only hopefully in this glitch here. And then the real part of the correlation function might be something that's computable and, uh, and able to be compared with the holographic theory on one side and on the other side, the, um, uh, the bulk theory. Okay, I, I, I'm essentially finished. I had, there were more remarks I could make here. On how do you build a clock? Not easily. Some various clocks that you could think of. But to summarize, Clocks and quantum reference frames in general are not merely philosophical niceties. They're essential for knowing what and how to calculate in the sitter holography. Now, I did want to ask Edward a question. Uh, Edward, you communicated to me something yes. which I liked very much, but I can't confirm it. You argued that clocks, eter eternal clocks, yes. eternal clocks with energy bounded from below are asymptotically T invariant. And I think what you meant by that is that if a clock runs long enough, it will make a transition from a forward going clock to a backward going clock and so forth. Is that a true statement? Uh, essentially, yes. Well, what I meant was that if you have a clock with energy bounded below, yeah. you can't define an operator which is equal to T. Yeah. You can define an operator that's equal to the absolute value of T. Yeah. So it first runs down and then it runs back up. So you could take the opera. So in our paper, the Hamiltonian mm -hmm. is Q. 
but Q was bounded below, let's say by zero, the precise lower bound yeah. doesn't yeah. Now, naively, the canonical conjugate, which is supposed to be the time with the P equals minus ID by DQ. Yeah. But that can't be defined on the half line as a self adjoint operator. No, I understand. What can be defined as a self adjoint operator is P squared. For no. example, the Dirichlet or no. Neumann boundary conditions, yeah. given two different operators. Right. And you can also take the positive square root of P squared, which I could call absolute mm -hmm. P. So there's an operator that corresponds to the absolute value of the time, but there's no operator that corresponds to the time. Okay, we could take we could take p squared over two m, but uh, you know require the support of the wave function to be in some narrow range of p over which p squared uh, looks linear. So sorry, sorry. So p is of... trying to be p is trying yeah. to be the time here. Yeah. So we call yeah. the Hamiltonian Q. You, it's backwards from. Yeah, your I know, I know. Since I realize. Since we call the Hamiltonian Q, the time should be p. Exactly. But yeah, there's no. But still, p. but there is an operator absolute value of p. I know, but that's a very formal statement. It is. Yes. It seems to me, it seems to me that a particle, for example, moving on a circle with a uh, with a wave function which is supported for positive momentum, will stay supported for positive momentum forever, and um, therefore the average of is it q dot or p dot? Uh, uh, the average of the velocity will remain positive forever. But what is the operator that you want to call time? For a particle moving in a circle. Well, no, you have... I, no I, I don't. Th I don't think so. Uh, Since you I have, think a this, I think this heavy particle moving on a circle, uh, with uh, a wave function supported by positive values of the momentum or the angular momentum, will, con in any physically sensible meaning, will continue to move forward in time for all time. Yeah, I don't. Think, I, I don't think there's going to come a time when you're going to see it moving backward. But it, what variable do you call time? If you want to use that as a clock, what do you regard as the time coordinate? Just the coordinate. But isn't there a more basic problem since it's yeah, a it, it'll spread out, but it will continue to move forward. I, I'm not. I don't know why you're not concerned that it only tells time modulo one, or modulo one hour, or whatever, because the coordinate on the circle is a periodic variable. I see. I see. Okay. Yes, um, the first paper I ever wrote was about uh, time variables for harmonic oscillators and uh, phase variables for rotors of this type, 1963, I think. So yes, I, I, let me not disagree. I, I, I agree. The reason I like this idea is because then even in the context of the eternal clock, one will also have, uh, have to worry about whether there are positive going clocks in negative going clocks. Uh, and if you wait long enough, uh, you'll see on the average. But I, I, I'm not sure it's yeah. true. Well, in our, uh, I do want to stress that, that in our approach, it's oversimplified to say that the observable is phi of tau. Well, it would be phi of the absolute value of tau more nearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or phi of the absolute value of tau plus a constant. Mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. makes sense. I understand. OK, I think my question is answered. Um, I did have one other question. This does have to do with von Neumann algebras. Um, uh, is there time to ask the question? Sure. Okay. Uh, 